All right, so now we're gonna look at leukocytes and platelets. Leukocytes are the white blood cells. Platelets are also called thrombocytes. In this video lecture, we're just gonna look at a little bit background uh, or general concepts about the different types of leukocytes because we'll end up spending a lot more time looking at their functioning when we do immune system. And then we're gonna look a little, very briefly about platelets because we'll spend more time on what the platelets do when we talk about hemostasis. So just some general characteristics about leukocytes. First of all, they only stay in circulation for a short period of their life cycle because the, the pathogens or the bacteria or the tumors are not in the blood. We need to get, them, get those white blood cells out of the blood so they can migrate through the connective tissues and destroy all these nasty pathogens or tumor cells for that matter. So they only are gonna use the circulatory system as a way to get from point A to point B in a fast manner. In order to get out of the blood, they use a process called diapodesis. This is basically the way a white blood cell squeezes itself between two adjacent blood vessel wall cells. These blood vessel wall cells are called endothelial cells and they have to squeeze their way in between those endothelial cells in order to get out of the blood. So that's called diapodesis. Once they're out of the blood, they've got to find, let's say, the bacteria and they use a uh, process called positive chemotaxis to do that. Now chemotaxis, chemo refers to chemical, taxis to movement. So this is moving in response to a chemical. And so they're gonna look at a chemical gradient that's set up by the bacteria itself. The bacteria is doing its thing living in the, in the tissues and it ends up excreting usually a waste product or at least some kind of chemical. And so close to the bacteria, you're gonna have a high concentration of that chemical farther away from the bacteria you go, the less concentrated that chemical is because the chemical is going to diffuse out away from the bacteria. So all the white blood cell has to do is follow an increasing concentration of that chemical and it will arrive at that bacteria and then be able to get rid of it. So it's like following a little trail of breadcrumbs. All you're doing is following an increased concentration of the chemical that's secreted by the bacteria and then once it's there, it can engulf the bacteria or phagocytize it, which you probably covered in, in your first anatomy and physiology course. And that's the idea of engulfing the bacteria by extending out cytoplasmic extensions or pseudopods that surround it, and then that engulfs it. There are different kinds of white blood cells. They are classified into two general categories. There's granulocytes, and then there's agranulocytes. The granulocytes consist of the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils. The monocytes and lymphocytes are called agranulocytes. Some of the granulos, some of the white blood cells are phagocytotic, others like lymphocytes are not. And we'll see which ones are, are the best at phagocytosis in a little bit. The granulocytes consist of the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils, again, because they have little granules in their cytoplasm that are visible when we look at them in a microscope. Monocytes and lymphocytes don't have that. Uh, as far as the numbers, neutrophil is the most abundant, and then the next in line are the lymphocytes, and then the monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils in that order. Your book will tell you the numbers. I don't care that you know the numbers. I just want you to know them in order from most abundant to the fewest of those. So to remember that, all you need to do is go never let monkeys eat bananas and you're, you're set because that gives you obviously the order. The neutrophils then are again the most abundant of the types of white blood cells. They are multi-lobe nucleus where the nucleus divided up. You can see in the picture kind of in the lobes. So sometimes you'll hear these neutrophils referred to as polymorphonuclear leukocytes, which is really a pain in the neck name, but that's where you'll see it often in the literature. These neutrophils increase in bacterial infections because their job is to phagocytize them and get rid of them, but they can only eat so many bacteria or engulf so many bacteria, about one to two dozen before they die. So they have a limited capacity for engulfing bacteria. They also secrete a couple things like prostaglandins, which increase capillary permeability or lead to inflammation and they secrete antimicrobial chemicals like defensins, which is similar to lysozyme. Eosinophils have pink 
or orange granules because they stain pink or orange in the presence of the dye eosin. So that's how we see them. We see an increase in eosinophils when we have parasitic infections and somewhat for allergic reactions, but think more about the parasitic infections. Since a parasite typically is too big to engulf through phagocytosis, think of a parasitic worm, these eosinophils release toxic compounds that basically digest the parasite from the outside working in, but that chemical can't differentiate between the parasite and our own tissues, so it engulfs or it digests some of our own tissue and therefore can cause tissue damage and cause more inflammation. But these eosinophils also are important modulators of the immune response, that is they help regulate our immune system so it doesn't go too crazy. Basophils are another, of course, of the granulocytes. These have the dark violet granules. Matter of fact, there's so many granules in there that when we look at it in our scope, it's hard to see that U or S-shaped nucleus hidden inside. Um, these guys we see increase in chickenpox, sinusitis, and diabetes. They are also related to allergic reactions because they secrete histamine. Histamine causes blood vessels to dilate and therefore get leakier and produce more fluid. And therefore, that is your runny nose in an allergic or hay fever kind of response. Heparin is another substance that they release, and this prevents blood clotting, which we don't want blood clots where we're trying to get cells mobilized to fight off some kind of infection because that'll just interfere with their ability to get there. The lymphocytes are the smallest of the white blood cells. These are eight granulocytes. They have a really large blue nucleus and blue cytoplasm. Matter of fact, the nucleus takes up so much of the room, there's barely any cytoplasm left. You can see a little bit of cytoplasm over here on the edge. They are the ones that are going to increase incredibly in infections or some type of immune response. And so we'll spend a lot of time with these guys when we do an immune system. They differentiate into T cells and B cells. T cells are used to coordinate the actions of other immune cells or to attack viral infected or tumor cells. And then the B cells are the ones that are going to end up making antibodies and then providing our immune memory, that is they remember an infection. So if you get, infe you get infected with the same antigen again, you'll have a quicker immune response to deal with it. The monocytes are the biggest of the lymphocytes, or excuse me, leukocytes. They are also um, another a granulocyte. They have a big horseshoe shaped kid, um, or kidney shaped nucleus. You see these increase in bacterial and viral infections and inflammation. They are also phagocytotic, very aggressively phagocytotic in that they don't, aren't limited like the neutrophils. They can only eat, you know, a dozen or so. They can eat them indefinitely. They also play an important role in the immune response by what's called presenting the antigens, which won't make sense right now, but when we get to immune system, it will. The monocytes will become macrophages when they leave circulation. So think of monocyte as an immature stage and a macrophage as a more um, advanced stage or mature stage. Leukocyte production is called leukopoiesis. It develops from this pluripotent cell into, remember it differentiates either the lymphoid or myeloid stem cells, which we covered in a previous video lecture. The myeloid stem cell becomes all of the cells but the lymphocytes. They just, in this picture, grouped all the white, the granulocyte white blood cells together. So this would be the basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils down here. Here's the monocyte, which becomes a macrophage. And the lymphoid stem cells going to either differentiate to T cells by basically finishing their development in the thymus. The B cells finish their development actually in bone. They'll become what are called plasma cells. Those are the cells that actually make the antibodies. And the third type is natural killer lymphocytes, or they'll just say, call them natural killer cells. These aren't considered blood cells because they never go into circulation in our blood, but they're also going to be important for immune response. So we'll spend a lot of time with these guys, particularly uh, when we do the immune system. Now these circulating white blood cells don't stay in the bloodstream for very long. You can see here the granulocytes leave 
about eight hours, live for about five days. Monocytes leave after about 20 hours and live for several months. So they're going to spend more time or more of their life in the connective tissues or lymphatic tissues than they are actually in blood. White blood cells also provide that long-term immunity that can last for decades because, as I mentioned before, the memory cells that are responsible for that long-term immunity. Some abnormalities in leukocyte counts are going to basically be either too many or too few. So leukopenia is low white blood cell counts. We see this with things like radiation, poisoning or poisons or anti-cancer drugs that are going to be affecting the bone marrow so that they um, destroy or, or limit the number of stem cells, so therefore limit the number of blood cells. And that would also affect all the blood cells, including the platelets and um, red blood cells. Glucocorticoids also work in lowering white blood cell counts because remember cortisol is one of its job is to reduce the immune response or inflammation. And so therefore it does it by lowering white blood cell counts or would result in lowering white blood cell counts. Typically, if you have leukopenia, you are more susceptible to infection because you don't have those white blood cells to fight those, that infection. Leukocytosis, it means high white blood cell counts. The cause of these, of course, could be infection because you have an infection and the white blood cells are multiplying to deal with that infection. Or it could be allergies. So you see an increase in the number of white blood cells um, as a hypersensitivity type of response. You can also see high white blood cell counts in diseases such as cancers because those white blood cells are trying to get rid of the tumor cells. A differential count can help distinguish which or what kind of disease you may have. So you would expect, for example, in a parasitic infection, you'd have a high number of eosinophils since that's their job to fight off um, the bacterial or excuse me the parasitic infections you'll see a higher number of neutrophils and monocytes if you have a bacterial infection so that type of thing would become important leukemia is a cancer of the hemopoietic tissue it's somewhere along the development of White blood cells, a single cell gives rise to unspecialized cells that reproduce out of control. So you think of cancers basically as the cell cycle being ignored. Remember the cell cycle is regulated or controlled and so that the cells don't reproduce too much. Well here the cell cycle is being ignored and the cell is just re is undergoing mitosis repeatedly, often losing its, the cell loses its functionality or what it's supposed to be doing. And because you've got a tumor growing, those cancer cells could then interfere with actual normal bone marrow function and cause more problems. The stem cell line that is affected helps determine what kind of leukemia you have. If it's a myelocytic leukemia, then it's a myoblast cell line has become cancerous. So it could be all the way back here to the myeloid stem cell, or it could be one of the cells farther along in the development. Lymphocytic leukemias then would be the lympho lymphoid cell line that is affected. So it's either the lymphoid stem cell or lymphoblast or another cell that has become cancerous. So we divide the cancers then into either lymphocytic or myelitic, myelocytic or myelitic cancers that way. We can also divide leukemias into either acute, which is quickly advancing, usually it happens when you've got a blast type cell that ha that ends up becoming cancerous. So one of the earlier stages in development, you see acute leukemias. Chronic leukemias are seen um, when it's a later stage in the cell development that becomes cancerous. And so they are more slow in advancing. And so you can put these two together so you, as a type of leukemia. So you can have acute myelocytic or chronic myelocytic acute lymphocytic or acute or excuse me chronic lymphocytic and that would be the four basic types of leukemia different types of leukemias have different kinds of outcomes and that's well beyond where we need to go right now with it 
The effects, basically normal cell numbers are disrupted because the cancer cells are taking over the bone marrow, leaving no room for normal bone marrow functioning. The patient then, because they don't have white blood cells doing their normal stuff, are going to be more subject or have a higher incidence of, of opportunistic infections or anemia. Again, you're not getting red blood cells made either or impaired clotting because you're not making platelets. Now platelets are the last guys that we want to look at and just again very briefly I want to just mention how they're formed. The megakaryocyte is in charge of making platelets and all it's doing is forming or having little pieces of its cytoplasm break off. As you can see here some of the, the cytoplasm kind of streams into the blood vessel and then it breaks off in pieces in the in the blood and therefore there's our little um, platelets. So you can think of platelets really as cell fragments, not really cells themselves. Normal counts are between 150 to 500,000. About a third of that usually hides in the spleen or is held in the spleen so that we can mobilize it for major circulatory crises. And of course platelets function in hemostasis which is where we're going to go next in our video lectures.